Um, so this is um, a combination of uh, three papers that I'm working on, and I'll give you the, the overview uh, for the purposes of making it a very friendly and uh, uh, accessible talk. And so the big question is one that I'm sure you're all uh, very aware of, uh, that there, there's, there's a big urban-rural divide. Um, and there may be at least two Europes, you know, so on your left, you see this, this dynamic and fast-paced, you know, so fast-paced you can't even get your eyes around it, um, <laughs> urban community. Uh, and then on your right, you see the bucolic and calm uh, countryside. And uh, people in the, the big cities tend to be more <coughs> cosmopolitan, you know, they identify beyond their nation, they identify um, um, as, as diverse, part, diverse cultures. Uh, whereas people in the countryside are, are more attached to their nationality, and everyone here knows this uh, oversimplified uh, divide that, that exists in many places. Um, to give you some evidence of that, this is the Brexit map, um, and the red ones are the, uh, the more red, the more in favor of leave, and so you can see that, uh, as you know, um, it, around London, uh, Manchester, uh, where the places, and then of course Scotland, which is slightly different, but, but there was a big urban-rural divide there. Um, this is the U.S. presidential election in 2016, and you can see the, uh, in blue, is the Clinton vote, and you can see that it was higher in the urban cores and approaches zero uh, in the rural areas. Um, uh, so this also exists on this side of the Atlantic. Um, and these are some of the data that I, that I look at in my papers. So these are immigration attitudes across Europe, and then if we go through these different geographic levels, we see the largest cities all the way down to the countryside, the attitudes get progressively more negative, with one being the most positive and zero being the most negative. Um, I also, the same thing holds for attitudes towards European unification. You know, people in the largest cities are more positive, people in the countryside are more negative. That too taps into notions of you know, how attached to the nation should we be, how willing are we to look beyond our national community. Um, and the European Parliament is another indicator of that. Um, also, our friends uh, with the uh, radical right, um, these are parties that are generally um, very nationalist uh, and opposed to cosmopolitan uh, ideologies. And so if you're in the countryside, you're much more likely to support the radical right, whereas if you're in the large cities, you're much less likely to support uh, the radical right. So these are all things that, that you've been thinking about, uh, uh, I'm sure. Um, so uh, there's this big geographic polarization. This talk is mainly about Europe. It also exists in the US and elsewhere. Mm -hmm. um, but so why is this important? What, what, what uh, broader themes does this tap into? Um, well, for starters, um, it, it symbolizes the territorial fracturing of the nation state because if people in the countryside and the city can no longer agree on the basis of their community, well then maybe we need to rethink this national community and maybe our national community uh, is no longer uh, viable. Um, now of course that's not a new thing. Um, in the 19th century, most of these countries were severely divided between the urban areas and the rural areas. Um, as you may know, industrialization was one of the big issues in the 19th century, and the large cities were the places, or cities um, were the places where industrialization was taking off, uh, and there was a whole different economic logic and economic incentives and political interests in big cities as opposed to the countryside. Um, and there were severe um, economic, political, and cultural divides between people who had lived for generations on farms and people who were developing this new uh, industrial culture. Um, but uh, in the 20th century, one of the big things that politics achieved was that it uh, smoothed over those urban-rural divides uh, and then began the era of mass culture, aided by all other things, you know, including first the radio, then television, um, and technology, and railroads, and, and then eventually airplanes. So in the 20th century, we had these mass uh, nations, and that was in some respects the heyday of mass national culture, pre-internet, of course. Um, and so there was a, a, a decline in the urban world divide, and again, people saw themselves as American, French, uh, German, etc., uh, more than they had uh, in the 19th century. But as you know, we're coming back to that urban rural split, so we're picking up that divide um, again. Uh, and of course, in slightly new ways, 
the internet being one way that we can fragment out, but uh, in addition, this broader cosmopolitan angle and the big cities being connected to this uh, cosmopolitan culture that exists, uh, you know, uh, uh, to some extent above and beyond the nation. Um, lots of ways of thinking about it. So um, we're now returning to that split. Um, and it, it raises the question, so, you know, we had this national unity for a couple of decades in the middle of the 20th century, um, and now we no longer have it, so should we stay in these nations, you know? What is the basis for this national unity? Um, if we can no longer agree on, on, on what, what binds us together, then, you know, what should we do? Um, and this is a big question that, that all of these elections and, and all of these societies are, are actively debating. Again, as I'm sure you uh, have been following. Um, so, uh, if we look to research um, and want to understand why the urban, so, that, so that's the, the, the big macro picture, and then for me, the research question has been, why are urban and rural areas divided? Because it's very easy to, to show those descriptive statistics, um, but it's not necessarily clear why it has gotten to that point. Um, and there are two main explanations, um, context and composition, uh, and I'll talk about and of course, at any time, if you have questions or, or burning comments, um, feel free to interject. Um, so um, context is the notion that uh, the divides are caused by the experience of living in these contexts. So something about the experience of living in an urban area or a rural area makes you more cosmopolitan or national. Um, and there are several ways in which this could operate. One is population density, so there are arguments that when people live close together, uh, they're forced to become more tolerant of each other just as a practical way of getting along, uh, whereas if you have more space, you can become more crotchety uh, and, and say that, you know, I don't want uh, different kinds of, uh, of, of diversity. Um, in addition, large cities tend to have more foreign people, and so there are arguments about how being exposed to foreign people makes you more tolerant of them. Of course, as you all know, there are lots of arguments about being exposed to foreign people makes you more hostile toward them. Uh, that's an ongoing debate. Um, but in large cities, since there are so many foreign people, clearly the exposure is not making people hostile, at least on a citywide level. Um, and so therefore, on the city level, uh, the, the argument is that when you live in the cities and you see all the foreign restaurants and you go to the dance performances um, and you become friends with them, then you start to appreciate uh, diverse, uh, multicultural, cosmopolitan societies. And finally, there's the economic argument that in large cities, uh, as you probably know, as you scope out your, your future uh, professional trajectories, large cities have had lots of economic opportunity over the past several decades. They've been connected to the global knowledge economy, uh, and so therefore people who want to work in these places uh, uh, are, if you live in those environments, you see lots of opportunity, you feel connected to the world, uh, and, you, and you see that opening as a positive thing. Whereas if you live in a desolate farming community where the farms are going bankrupt and everyone is, is strung out on heroin, then you're uh, less likely to feel positive about this global uh, community. So something about the experience of living in those large cities versus those uh, rural areas might make people open to the world or, or closed to their nation. However, um, the other argument is that it's composition, that people don't randomly sort into urban and rural areas. So something about the type of people who are more likely to live in urban areas, above and beyond where they live, um, might make those urban areas more positive. Um, and this, uh, more and more cosmopolitan. Uh, and this can operate in two ways. One is demographically. So in particular, highly educated and professional people are more likely to be in cities and highly educated and professional people are more likely to be cosmopolitan regardless of where they live. Um, so it could just be a function of them being overweighted in the big cities. Um, whereas low, people without a lot of education and manual workers are more likely to live in rural areas. And again, those people tend to be more nationalist regardless of where they live. Um, and then there's also the cultural argument that above and beyond your occupation or your education, if you want to have lots of uh, cultural opening to the world, you might find your way to the big city. And so you might culturally sort yourself into the big city. 
Whereas if you want to remain in an old fashioned traditional community, you might sort into rural areas. So, uh, so, so the types of people who live in these areas might uh, uh, reflect the, the, the divides. And the implications of these two arguments is that uh, it sets up very different understandings of what this divide is all about. Um, if the divide is about urban versus rural areas and something about those experiences, then again, it's something about the experience of those geographic communities uh, that, is, that is dividing our nations. And, and it's kind of a patchwork, but it would, hard to be, so it would be a patchwork of urban and rural uh, communities. Whereas the other one, also a patchwork, but it's a patchwork of, of economic profiles and potentially cultural profiles that go much deeper than, than geography. So there are two different ways of understanding what is, what is dividing society. So that's what I set out to uh, explore, and I did that with several different papers, and I'll give you um, a summary of the results. Um, so the first one, I looked across Europe uh, at um, 13 different countries, um, and uh, uh, I, uh, and this is a, this, these are data from uh, 13 West European countries, 2002, 2016. Um, and here I have the immigration attitudes, both by geography uh, and then by demography. So the gray uh, bars are for people who are highly educated and professionals, and the black bars are for people without secondary education and manual. And you see that there's a pretty strong uh, uh, connection uh, within demographic profiles. So if you're highly educated, it doesn't matter where you live, you're always extremely positive um, about immigration. Uh, and similarly, if you uh, have less education, you're a manual worker, again, it doesn't matter where you live. There's a slight bump uh, in the big cities, um, but the real divide here is not geographic, um, it is uh, uh, demographic. So this is the first piece of, of suggestive evidence that, that uh, demography, demographic composition, um, may be driving this. Um, but uh, to really get into the notion of, of cultural context, cultural composition, uh, I need to turn to other data from Switzerland, and this is panel data, but, but first let me say two things about Switzerland. Um, one is it's an interesting place, but it's very wealthy, um, very globalized. Um, uh, but at the same time, they have huge divides, um, one of them being language. Um, but interestingly, um, in, in recent years, the urban-rural divide within Switzerland is, is in many ways larger than the uh, uh, language divide, which used to be such a, a large structure. So there's a, a big urban-rural divide there. Um, you know, if you're in the Alps, if you're in the bars, you know, it's a very different um, uh, perspective on life, and so the question is why. Um, and so these, and, and here is just um, some indication of that. I looked with these, I looked at three types of attitudes. I looked at uh, immigration attitudes, you know, equal opportunities for foreigners, better opportunities for Swiss, EU attitudes, joining the EU, not joining the EU, and then uh, support for the radical right. And again, we see that uh, as you get more urban, you're more cosmopolitan, as you get more rural, you're less cosmopolitan. Um, but these data are also useful because they're panel data, and so they allow me to observe the same individual over time, and therefore I can observe <coughs> the people who are more positive about, more cosmopolitan, are more likely to self-select into the urban areas, and I can also look at uh, if moving to the urban areas changes people, which would be the uh, uh, contextual argument. Um, so here is, uh, again, first, um, the, 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 this is repeating the slide that I showed earlier, demography and geography, and you can see that it's not quite as clean as the uh, Europe-wide immigration one. Um, immigration, which is the, the top four, um, I did this by education and occupation separately, there's the largest demographic divide for, for those. The demographic divide is a bit smaller. We see stronger geographic effects for for um, the EU attitudes and for the radical right. So there is some geographic dispersion even within demographic categories. Um, and that, that dispersion, what did I put next? Um, uh, 
And so that demographic dispersion, that, that, that geographic dispersion um, could be due to any number of factors. So I also did some additional analyses. It's called a decomposition analysis. And essentially allows me to see how much of the geographic gap uh, is accounted for by demography. And um, for immigration attitudes, demography accounts for roughly half of the, the gap, whereas it's smaller, as I said, for EU attitudes, a third to a quarter, um, and uh, similar for supporting the radical right. Um, so the question is, the rest of that gap could be cultural composition. So um, there are these geographic gaps that cannot be accounted for by uh, demography, which is you know, uh, highly educated people being more likely to live in cities. So maybe it's the fact that people who are more cosmopolitan self-select into those cities, whereas people who are more nationalist self-select into rural areas. Um, and that's what we call cultural sorting. So just skipping straight to the results, um, there is some support for that. Um, people who are more positive about immigration, people who have less, are less likely to support the radical right, they are more likely to move to large cities. I looked at who's more likely to move to a large city, and if you are, uh, if you are cosmopolitan, you are more likely to move to a large city. Uh, similarly, if you're negative about immigration, anti-immigration, that predicts people moving to rural areas. So, these are both consistent with the notion that people are sorting into big cities, the cosmopolitans are sorting into the big cities, the uh, anti-cosmopolitans are sorting into rural areas. Um, in addition, if you're more positive about immigration uh, and the EU, you're gonna get out of the rural areas. So, so people who live, among people who live in rural areas, who leaves uh, is strongly predicted by, um, by cosmopolitan attitudes. So this is all consistent with the notion that above and beyond demography, there's some cultural sorting that many of you may have thought about when you chose your own uh, locations in life um, or your own future. Um, and it's also important to note that this is not confounded by socioeconomic status um, because movers in general are generally more higher socioeconomic status because moving long distance, you know, not moving to the ramshackle house down the street, but making a significant move um, you know, across the country requires a lot of money. Um, and so people who move long distance tend to be um, more highly educated and professionals. They also therefore tend to be cosmopolitan. But even once I include controls for that, we see an additional uh, 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 relationship between these cultural predictors. So there is evidence of, of cultural sorting. Um, so cultural composition matters. Um, the question is, um, which matters more? Um, and this is showing us um, uh, this is showing us uh, cosmopolitan attitudes across moving status and across demography. Um, and we can see that uh, for this is moving to cities. And in the top, um, these uh, among education, the black bar shows you that uh, manual uh, lower educated people uh, who move to cities are pretty positive. They're pretty much as positive as highly educated people who never live in cities. So this is a this suggests that that uh, there's a significant amount of, of cultural sorting among, among those groups. Similarly, down here we see um, a lot of, of cultural sorting among the uh, low, low SES group, um, low education there, just as uh, they're, they're not very likely, to, if you move to the urban areas uh, and you don't have much education, you're even less likely to support uh, the radical right than highly educated people who never move to the uh, urban areas. So um, uh, a fair amount of, of cultural sorting, again, for the low SES group. Um, not much uh, in the rural people who move to rural areas. Um, so moving to rural areas, there is the gap here is mainly um, demographic. Um, so, so what that suggests is that uh, the uh, cultural sorting matters more for who moves to urban areas. The people move to urban areas uh, in, in, in search of fulfilling their, their cultural preferences. Um, whereas for who lives in the rural areas, it's less about people moving to rural areas because they want to embrace their nationalism and it's more just that uh, the demographics of, of rural areas is a stronger uh, predictor. And then finally, I'm not sure how far to go with this. I mean, those data that I just showed you suggested that lower SES people were more likely to culturally sort, uh, that it was stronger for them 
I'm not sure how strong that is or, or how much it's a quirk of these particular data. Um, I've pursued some additional analyses. We can talk about it later if you want. Um, I'm, I'm less, uh, less uh, secure on that finding, but I think the, the first two are, are more uh, robust. So cultural, so, so composition matters a lot, um, you know, both demographically and culturally. Um, but there was that whole other thing, the contextual effects. So, you know, what about actually living in these places? Does that matter? Um, and there are two ways that I can analyze that. One is by looking at people who move to uh, urban or rural areas and then observing if their attitudes change from before they move and after they move. Um, and that's how you can see if there was an effect. If, you know, living in big cities made you cosmopolitan, you know, after moving there, your attitudes uh, should change. And the same thing for the rural areas. In addition, I can compare people who spend their entire lives in these areas, because um, the people who spend their entire lives in those areas, you know, I can't quite measure the extent to which they've ever stepped foot outside of these places, but nonetheless, they've had a severe, long, life, lifelong uh, exposure to either urban or rural uh, stimuli, and so therefore they're likely to be more heavily influenced by those, as opposed to people perhaps like many of us who've moved around a patchwork of places and we're, we're a patchwork of, of influences, although maybe I shouldn't because then it's just used to you. Um, so this is the time trend, I do that, I mean I can go into details if you want, but this is comparing time trends of people who move and don't move. Um, and essentially, the, the, the middle point, the zero, is, is the, the point of moving. And so if there were contextual effects, we would see, and these are plotting the difference between movers and non-movers. And so if there, were, if there were strong contextual effects, we would expect to see zero difference between movers and non-movers before they move, and then big differences after they move. Um, but as you can see, we pretty much don't see any differences um, between these groups uh, before they move or after they move. Um, and this is for moving to rural areas. Uh, I did a lot of other analyses on different subsets according to age and socioeconomic status, where they moved from, and with, you know, it's not just moving to rural areas, maybe moving from big cities to rural areas, lots of additional analyses, and there's really um, no evidence that moving to these places um, matters. Um, what about living your whole life? Uh, in an urban or rural, or rural area. Are those lifers uh, somehow different? <coughs> um, no difference in immigration attitudes or EU attitudes. Um, there was some difference in that the rural, the li rural lifers were more likely to support the radical right. Um, however, that goes away after controlling for demography. So rural lifers are more likely to be um, older, less educated, more manual, and then so once you control for that, there's no additional lifer uh, effect here. Um, and uh, I mean, I can get into this. Uh, I also look at parental measures of education and occupation um, uh, because living uh, your whole life in a rural area might affect your occupation, and so therefore, um, looking at people by occupation might not be might be confounded, but if I look at the parental education and occupation, um, that cannot affect, uh, being living your whole life there cannot affect your parents' education, um, and the results are the same. We can talk more about that if you'd like. Um, so, uh, as I said, I also looked into many other ways, um, specific urban and rural environments, um, you know, Maybe it's only urban areas with high population density, only the urban areas with more foreign people, uh, different economic conditions, you know, unemployment. Um, uh, does it matter more for younger people or older people? The answer is no. Um, and so, to summarize what I have found thus far, um, demographic and cultural composition matter a lot. Urban and rural areas are different because of the types of, of education profiles and occupation profiles that live in the areas and also people's uh, preferences that, that, that lead them to sort. Um, no evidence of contextual effects. Um, what about the neighborhood level? Um, as everyone knows, um, big cities are not all these big blobs. Um, you know, there are different neighborhoods and cultural environments vary quite significantly across neighborhoods. Um, and the same goes for rural or, or suburban areas. Um, so for that, I look at evidence from Germany. Um, and Germany 
is a place where, you know, if you look at Berlin, you know, you can have uh, this type of, of, of shopping experience, um, and then you can also have this type of mm -hmm. cultural experience all in the same city. Uh, so, you know, cities are not <laughs> uniform places, as, as, as we all know. Um, so, uh, this is further um, evidence of that. Uh, I, I looked at neighborhoods according to how many, uh, how ethnically diverse <coughs> the neighborhoods are. Uh, so, uh, Q1 is the lowest uh, ethnic diversity, um, and Q4 is the highest ethnic diversity. And so you can see within big cities, um, the question about no immigration concerns, there is a 20 a point, a gap of 0.2, which is you know, one fifth of the entire scale um, between the areas that have low ethnic diversity and the areas that have high ethnic diversity. Um, there's less variation when you get into rural areas um, or other, which is a combination of, of suburbs and towns and villages that I couldn't cleanly classify. Um, but we see in big cities, um, big cities are not all the same. Uh, and so the most positive, the most cosmopolitan places are the ones that are not just in big cities, but that are very ethnically diverse. And that, again, is, is intuitive to you all, uh, I am sure. Um, so um, here I split it out, uh, again, looking at these uh, matching people according to demography and, uh, 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 and geography. And we see a pretty strong divide by demography. So um, if you live in the big city and the Q4, the high, uh, uh, that's the, the, the most ethnically diverse. Um, that, and then I compare that to the other types of cities and then other and rural, we see again that uh, uh, the demographic divide is pretty consistent. So if you're highly educated uh, and professional, it doesn't matter which type of neighborhood or where you live, um, you're always going to be um, more cosmopolitan or more positive about immigration. Um, that is what I just said. So there's strong evidence of demographic sorting even within neighborhoods. Um, there is modest evidence of, of cultural sorting. Um, the uh, pro-immigration people are more likely to move to those areas because again, people don't just randomly get dropped in neighborhoods. So there is some evidence that people who already have pro-immigration attitudes are more likely to move to those neighborhoods. Um, um, but again, this is this is modest. So what about contextual effects? Um, you know, does living around you know bath people eating pineapples out of bathtubs, you know, does that can that can seeing that on a daily basis make you? Um, uh, uh, cosmopolitan, you know, uh, you know. Um, short answer is not much. Um, so um, there's no evidence that moving to those areas really changes your attitude, using the same type of analysis that I did before. Um, there is uh, some evidence that if you live in big city neighborhoods and then those neighborhoods change over time, so you experience diversity as a, some, to some extent as an exogenous shock, um, so you're already living in those neighborhoods and suddenly it gets more diverse. Uh, there's some evidence that, that you become more positive about immigration. Um, but that effect is extremely modest. So it's about, um, for the mean level of, of diversity change, the growth, the positive growth is 0 .005 points per year on a scale of zero to one. Uh, so it's not really very important uh, substantively, even if there's a slight uh, a bump. In addition, as we know, diversity uh, and internationalness is not all created equal. Um, and so when there's a growth in African, Asian, Middle Eastern, and Turkish diversity, um, people don't get more positive. Um, they get more positive when, when more Europeans move uh, around them. Um, and uh, interestingly, which is all what you would expect, um, this effect is largest among the mobile population. So people who recently moved to those neighborhoods um, or people who will leave those neighborhoods. Um, and this reinforces, as opposed to more sta stable uh, people, sedentary, you might call them. And so this reinforces the notion that the, mo the connection between mobile people uh, and cosmopolitanism and raises a lot of questions about if they're supposed to be mobile and cosmopolitan, then why should they be affected by the neighborhood? Or you might have thought of them as being people who didn't even care where they lived because you know they're they're on the internet and everything. But uh, 
that was interesting, and, and there'll be some follow-up uh, research. So, in conclusion, um, the strongest evidence is that this urban-rural divide is about the types of people who live in these places um, and not the places causing people to uh, become uh, cosmopolitan or nationalist. Um, and so that suggests that these geographic divides that are very observable are actually second-order divides, and that the real divide is demographic and cultural, um, and then it just manifests one way in which that real divide manifests itself is through um, geographic sorting. Um, the neighborhood context, on the other hand, may, ma may matter. There's some, there's, there's stronger evidence there, um, but it's difficult to measure. Um, and even what I did observe, um, it's hard to know what it was about those neighborhoods, because I could show a relationship between neighborhoods that diversified more quickly and uh, changing attitudes, but it's hard to know what experience about those neighborhoods really made people change, whether it was the new diversity or something else that was associated with that. Uh, and if any of you are interested, I mean, a lot of the uh, recent research on how the context can affect your attitudes gets to be extremely micro level and to the extreme details of who I'm participating <coughs> with and how I'm participating in them. You know, it's, the neighborhood is experienced in, in many ways, as you all know, from your lives. And so, um, so, so it's hard to systematically compare that. It's probably extremely fine grain. Um, um, although, so if we want to have a little bit of hope, there's that mobile population, and so we're divided by culture um, and by uh, um, uh, 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 demography, but the um, mobile population uh, is also the most cosmopolitan, and perhaps they're the key to building bridges. You know, perhaps if they leave these diverse areas and go to the countryside, we might start to see um, uh, uh, some, some uh, reduction in the geographic divides. They do mostly go to other big cities or other diverse areas, but not entirely. Um, so again, as I said, there's a lot of, it's beyond the scope of what I'm talking about today, but looking at mobility and how it plays out and how people sort uh, in many ways is, is a very important and fascinating area. So there is lots more research to be done. Um, I will signal one thing, you know, I didn't present the stuff here. A lot of this stuff in the initial analysis is very similar across European countries, um, and there were lots of similarities. Nonetheless, there, there are also differences. As I said, all big cities are not the same, so um, that's always an interesting area to pursue. Um, and if we really want to unpack you know, cosmopolitanism, I was treating it as one thing, you know, immigration, EU attitudes, radical right, um, but there are interesting patterns and, and, and subdivisions. You know? People um, uh, uh, don't always group, look at these things all together, and so that's another area uh, that, that deserves more attention. Um, and of course, if you were, were interested in how to overcome the divides, because I think we're going to be stuck with the divides um, for some time, and so um, that's something that across all areas, beyond the urban-rural divide, people are looking at. So um, I hope that was interesting for you, um, and if you have some points of discussion,